attention to your flying tonight. Please stand by. Welcome back to another edition of the Science Night Podcast. I am James, and with me, as always, are Steffi. Hi! And Jason. Hello! This week, we're talking about falling starlings, concerning concentrations, and a fusion follow-up. In the second half, we have Jason's conversation with paleontologist and all-around crocophile, Casey Holliday. But first, the news. So, I'll speak for my colleagues on this one, but sometimes you put in the hours of research, editing, promotion, and you just wonder, is anyone listening to this podcast? And based on our first story, it seems like we have awoken something after our last episode. Well, eagle-eared listeners will remember our cautionary tale about solar storms in the last episode. (laughs) If not, here's a quick rundown. Jason and I made jokes, and Steffi told us we should do a better job at shielding our electronics so we're prepared for solar storms, because they're unpredictable and can damage the electronics we have come to rely on. And if you still need proof of that, you may have seen 40 of the 49 Starlink satellites launched by SpaceX crashing to the ground when two minor solar storms hit in quick succession disabling internet access to their customers and costing tens of millions of dollars in damage so i don't want to say we told you so but we kind of told you so what do we think about this cautionary tale one of many so there's plasma you know solar winds outside of our planet if you're not Preparing for that or taking that into account, things can go wrong. And that's kind of what happened here. So solar storm sends energy into the upper atmosphere. So it was a coronal mass ejection. Gave energy to those particles in the Earth's atmosphere, increased the density of the atmosphere, and so it swells. Basically kind of what happens, we call it jewel heating or omic heating. You drive current in these ionized particles, and that creates heat. And so it lifts up the atmosphere, uh, like steam rising. And then that leads to drag on these satellites, which then slows them down. And now they're going to be burned up. Oops. Yeah, That's a drag. Uh-huh. Oh, love it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, this was an interesting story, mostly because... This didn't even seem to register as a blip to SpaceX. They were like, ah, oh, whatever. You know, we have thousands of satellites now. I think almost 2,000 satellites up there. Yeah. So, you know, 40 of them crashing back to Earth doesn't really matter, right? But more than that, the fact that they weren't concerned about making a major miscalculation here yeah. is concerning to me, right? They didn't seem to even note that this was happening, even though they had advanced warning of the solar flares, right? And so it it's just kind of sad. It is. It was $100 million in hardware, too. And they're like, oops, let's try right. again. It, not not just the hardware, but the expense of getting them up there, too, right? Yes. Like, um, until we get one of those space elevators that the video games tell me we need, um, it's, it's a little hard to get things into space still. And yes. Yeah. We got, you know, so 49 satellites were affected and nine apparently were able to withstand the solar storm, which is a a great success rate. Survival Um, of the fittest satellites. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) A little bit, bit, yeah. (laughs) Now, just to play devil's advocate here and, and give SpaceX a little bit of a pass, there were it was it was kind of weird in the way that two solar storms kind of bounced off the atmosphere at the same time, right? That's not the usual thing. Um, or am I giving SpaceX a little bit too much credit? Well, I think if you're going to make your business model revolving around sending tourists up in the same way to a, a like a low level of the atmosphere, right? Not even high enough that like you could get away from this then making a major miscalculation like this when you don't have human lives is probably the best outcome. Yeah. But it's still a really scary like misunderstanding of what was happening. 
Yeah. But, you know, I think here's just across the, the transom here, SpaceX has said that uh, to avoid this, they will be launching uh, their commercial enterprises at night now, so they won't have to worry about solar storms. <laughs> <laughs> that's a groaner right there oh <laughs> you, you got it some insider information right here from that's right James. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first on science night <laughs> yes i mean you know are we are we expecting that spacex wouldn't say something like that oh no that sounds totally par for the course from spacex yeah yeah I'm just surprised. I mean, they have 2,000 satellites just in Starlink. Mm -hmm. And then we have about, I looked this up, 7,500 satellites orbiting Earth. Some aren't, you know, are inactive. Some are active. That's a lot of satellites that are clouding our atmosphere. It's true. Yeah. It's starting to remind me of, like, the end of WALL-E when they come back to Earth and there's just stuff all around the planet. You know, there's a little bit of irony in the fact that these are called Starlink as well, right? I mean, when they were taken out by our star. Yes. I will say, like, when the pandemic was going on and there was nothing to do outside of my house, at least I could walk outside and watch the Starlink satellites travel across the sky. So. Mm -hmm. And now you can do that as, like, a fiery ball they burn of up. <laughs> falling Starlinks. <laughs> Speaking of things that are just clogging the atmosphere, every episode, we seem to cover a story that inspires, like, an existential crisis right before the ad break, but not this week. Tonight, we're covering the nightmare scenario in the second spot. Who could have guessed it, but the current climate emergency is back in the news. And we often talk about this in terms of carbon, but a recent article from Nature has shown that the concentration of another stinkier greenhouse gas, methane, is getting to increasingly alarming levels of concentration in our atmosphere. Specifically, it's been measured at 1,900 parts per million, and the kind of creepier thing is we don't necessarily know the cause. However, that doesn't mean that humans get to take a victory lap on this one uh, because we are still totally affecting the release of methane in the planet's atmosphere. So what, what, what do we do now? We got to hold it in. No more methane release from humans. <laughs> well, I think that's going to be kind of hard, right? But at the same time, what was interesting to me was the concentration of different isotopes of carbon that they were able to isolate here to determine whether or not it was human caused or what they call anthropogenic causes for the release of this methane or something that was not anthropogenic or, or human caused. And they're attributing a lot of the more recent upticks in methane in the atmosphere to microbes that are generating methane. And so they're attributing these to not human causes. But I found that to be a really unsatisfying explanation because they were attributing these microbes to livestock in some cases here, which are absolutely human caused issues here. We're not talking about giant native herds of animals right. roaming the grasslands. We're talking about production farming here, right? Um, we're talking about livestock being raised for the meat industry or the dairy industry. And that is absolutely a human cause. The humans might not be the, the proximate cause but they're certainly the ultimate cause yeah. of this increase mm -hmm. in methane. Well, the other thing that I feel like they didn't really cover explicitly was the fact that like permafrost is thawing at an increasingly alarming rate. And there has been lots of methane that has been measured in ice cores and in these things. And you figure if it's no longer in the ice core or in the permafrost, it's got to go somewhere. And they weren't really talking about that either as a potential uh, human-based cause. I think they mentioned a little bit because they do talk about global warming creating this negative feedback loop. So releasing even more methane, making it harder to slow down these rising temperatures. And then cycle continues. So we really need to step in and do something. Right. And if you recall, several episodes back, uh, we talked with Jennifer Vertolin about her trip to COP26 
And it was eye-opening to hear her talking about, you know, the world's commitment to maintaining only a small or moderate amount of temperature change above pre-industrial levels, right? One and a half to two degrees. And it sounds like even if humans are stopping what we're doing, that we know we're doing to cause increases in greenhouse gases, that this negative feedback loop is going to make it so that all of that might be for naught anyway. Um, and so we have to find a, a solution that's going to account for the sort of exponential increases here and sources really that are causing uh, a rise in greenhouse gases as well. One of the major things we could do is clean up our energy grid a little bit. If only we knew somebody that could talk about a potential major breakthrough in fusion energy um, that happened <laughs> last week. <laughs> Who could it be? Wait, Steffi, yeah. don't you know something about plasma and fusion? You know, just a little bit. And tokamaks? It's just only my life. <laughs> Besides this podcast. <laughs> yes. I, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exclusive interview from Dr. Steffi Deem. BBC couldn't lock her down, but we got her. I'm going to do the smart thing and let her take it away and explain this story for okay. you, dear listener. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. The story, you probably saw the headlines. They go something like this. A giant donut-shaped machine just proved near limitless clean power source is possible. That is a bold headline. What actually happened? Okay. So these experiments were run in the UK at a device called the Joint European Taurus. So it's like a tokamak, a donut-shaped device. We use magnets to confine the fuel for fusion. And they produced the record amounts of fusion power. This was 59 megajoules um, for a sustained amount of time for five seconds. So a megajoule, one megajoule is equal to a one ton moving at 100 miles per hour. If you look at 59 megajoules, uh, that's kind of equivalent to a wind turbine powering one house for a day, just for context. Yeah, so produced a lot of power from fusion in a sustained amount of time. That was great. Um, that's the main headlines. What's pretty awesome, actually, is when you go into the details of what happened. They were running these experiments with the fuel for fusion, so the two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, so fusion power plant fuel. Awesome. The other thing was previous experiments are done in carbon walls because it's low impurity. It doesn't radiate power away. So easier to do experiments there. Um, what we really need to start doing is looking at power plant like walls that don't erode like carbon does. So metal walls, right? So these were done in metal walls, which is amazing because when they first did these experiments with the metal walls, they weren't getting the results they expected. So there was doubt that our large device eater would work. And so they refined their experiments, made more efficient magnetic bottles in jet with these metal walls and success. So that was super exciting. Yeah, I think I remember seeing on your social media that you got up early to like watch the returns of the results. Was this being live streamed? It did. Yeah, they live streamed it. Yeah, okay. they had a whole production. Yeah, it was That's pretty awesome. nice. You, so I can give you the link too. Yeah. That'd be great. So, I mean, I, I need to know then, were you watching because of your just pure interest in the research or were you watching to see if like this is what causes Flash Gordon? to happen. <laughs> okay, so deep down, we all want to be a superhero, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, but my superpower is fusion, so I want it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was awesome. You have the fuel for fusion power plants in a metal wall, power plant like wall, working and um, it verifying our calculations and predictions, which gives us more confidence that this will actually work. In larger devices. So last time we saw kind of results like this, there was an influx of funding, right? Yeah. Uh, potentially. So is there more potentials for more potential funding? Because that would be great. I think a lot of times, at least in the past year, when we see these breakthroughs in the news or these big exalt. Uh, results in the news. It gives more confidence to the private sector 
to mm-hmm. invest. And then federal governments do a lot of research investment as well. So I also saw right after right after these results were released, the nuclear doomsday clock got pushed back a few minutes based on these fusion results. So you're you're saving the world in an abstract way as well. Yes. <laughs> so I think it's interesting, Steffi, that we keep talking about sustained amount of time and we're talking five seconds, right? Which yep. is, you know, not that much of a sustained amount of time in the big picture. But when it comes to fusion, this is a huge leap. What's interesting to me is that the amount of energy produced in five seconds could power a house for an entire day. Like that is very exciting. But the reason that they can't go longer at this point is because the magnets that are used to hold the fuel source together there, um, they overheat, correct? Yeah. So this device, Jet, is an older machine. It's based on copper coils. Okay. Um, yep. So that limits your shot cycle or the time you run your experiment by five seconds because otherwise they'll overheat. More modern experiments have superconducting coils, so you can run them for longer. Eater, the next big device, and Spark that we also talked about. Eater has superconducting coils, and then um, Spark has high temperature superconducting coils. That's great. You can run your devices longer. You also need to, this is down the line, we need to find materials that can sustain that environment for longer, too. Excellent. So that's sort of the next step is to figure out how to keep that going for longer than five seconds. Now, the proof of principle is there and in a sustained way, too. The sort of focus of those experiments is going to change a little bit, correct? Yeah. So there are some experiments that can run for hours. Actually, they run at lower power because of that heat load that's limited by materials that are used in those current devices. The other thing that we have to worry about is heat and particle exhaust. So kind of like your car has an exhaust pipe, you get the same thing in fusion experiments. When you run for a long period of time, you have helium ash that you need to extract out. And so that was one of the reasons why Jet had these great results too. They had a better handling of exhaust in their machine. And so when we go to even longer time periods, that's further experiments will be done on that. Well, this is very exciting. It really is. I mean, yeah. the future is, is upon us, right? And I recognize that you know these results don't indicate that, that this is, you know, fusion energy is imminent. But it's certainly more imminent than it was even two weeks ago when you have yes. results like this. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I don't think we can take the full credit here at the Science Night Podcast, but I think we can take a little bit of credit for our, our hit episode, the 2021 Festival of Fusion, that you can find at com with our entire back catalog. I think they were sad that Jet wasn't in it, so, you know. Had you know, to come out they, with that big they, result it's now. It's in 2022. They're, it, yes. they're top, of the, top of the list for next year. Well, yep. I think what we need to do is figure out who is on the brink of making a huge advance and exclude them from the 2022 version just so that they do it. <laughs> yeah. So we, don't, we won't talk to Steffi next year is what you're saying? That's not going to be sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> well... I think that was great that we put a little bit of a bright spot at the end of the tunnel here in the news segment. And let's keep that positive energy going while we go to Jason's conversation with paleontologist, crocophile, Dr. Casey Holliday. That is going to come up after this message from a podcast that I think you will enjoy. Hear me. You smell the foul corruption. Things get a little strange here. And what about me? Like, really strange. Grotesque stench of rotten flesh. Yet consider this an invitation to our humble podcast. I'm only just starting. Just search, and we'll be waiting to greet you with a big hello. Come here. And welcome to Pulp from Beyond the Veil. We'd like to welcome to the podcast our guest today, Dr. Casey Holliday, who is an associate professor of anatomy at the University of Missouri School of Medicine. Casey, welcome to Science Night. Hi, thanks for having me. 
It's awesome to see you. Casey and I have known each other for a number of years. I have been fascinated with your work since I met you because you do some really cool three-dimensional reconstructions of soft tissue anatomy on fossils. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to paleontology and how you sort of brought anatomy into the paleo side? Yeah, sure. Um, I kind of discovered a long time ago that I like dead animals. And I like dead animals a lot more than live animals. Growing up, I was always into biology. I ended up going to college, thankfully, in which I ended up being a zoology major. After learning, I didn't want to work on people as a pre-medical student. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of a zoologist, but I also was working as a veterinary technician. And so for about five years, I actually had two jobs. One was working in a paleontology range at the Florida Museum of Natural History and then the Field Museum of Natural History as like a paleontologist and a collections worker and fossil preparator where I cleaned up fossil bones and stuff. So the Field Museum is in Chicago. Yeah, I was still working in Orlando at the time, though. So being a Floridian and stuff. But I was also working as a vet tech because I kind of wanted to go to vet school um, because I liked kind of bone biology and kind of craniofacial stuff and um, but in my second veterinary school interview, they told me I wasn't compassionate enough to be a veterinarian. Really right. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You did start off by saying you like dead animals a lot more than live animals. So maybe they were onto something. Well, ever since, you know, I largely try to figure out how animals are built. And that could be kind of animals alive today or animals that aren't alive today anymore. And that then includes all sorts of fossil extinct animals. Um, and so I kind of found myself in this weird part of our science where we try to figure out kind of the history of vertebrate life on Earth and how things have changed over time and how kind of modern crocodiles or modern birds evolved from their stocks of, of extinct animals like, you know, fossil crocodiles or, or non-avian dinosaurs like velociraptors and tyrannosaurs and sauropods and stuff. So most of your work has been focused on birds, crocodilians, lizards, and you've been interested sort of in understanding how the bony remnants of these animals reflect how soft tissue anatomy is built in these animals. So I remember reading a paper by, uh, by you several years ago about special touch receptors in the faces of crocodilians, which I thought was one of the coolest papers I'd ever seen. Tell us a little bit about that, you know, very spongy looking skin that's on the, the noses, on the snouts of, of crocodilians and, and sort of what you found. Yeah, sure. So um, alligators and crocodiles, all of today's living, living crocodilians actually have these little touch receptors all around their face. They look like little black freckles or dots if you get up close enough to an alligator or crocodile face. And crocodiles even have them on their bellies. All down their bellies, they'll have these little things called um, dome pressure receptors or integumentary sense receptors. And these little receptors basically act like invisible whiskers. And so crocs can basically feel vibrations in the water without needing their eyes. And so they, uh, some physiologists figured out how they work by slathering um, alligator faces with Vaseline, and the alligators couldn't really find direction towards prey items that were dropped in the water because they couldn't feel things with all these touch receptors. Mm -hmm. So we've had a big, long interest in when those receptors kind of evolved amongst crocs because crocs weren't always living in the water. They didn't always need to have invisible whiskers, so to speak. So um, we just got off a NSF grant looking at kind of how modern crocs evolve their skulls in particular, we've been working on kind of feeding biomechanics, but also kind of somatic sensation or the, or the evolution of face touch. And so one of my graduate students, Emily Lesner, has been kind of leading that project up. And right now she's in the midst of writing papers and presenting them, but we pretty much have a good idea of when these invisible whiskers came online in croc evolution. Um, and this is actually before we actually expected to. So it looks like they had the stuff working before they um, went into the water, which is interesting. we got to figure out why land yeah. still needed invisible whiskers. And so that's been really cool. And then we've also been kind of using comparative neurology, basically, the idea of kind of what the trigeminal nerve is doing across different animals to get a feel for how sensitive the faces of birds and dinosaurs and lizards and and things outside of crocodiles are also. Let's talk about the trigeminal nerve for a second, because I'm guessing that most of our listeners may have heard about the trigeminal nerve, but most of them have no idea, I'm guessing, what it does. What can you tell us about cranial nerve five? So it's one of the, there's cranial nerve zero that's been identified in some places. Traditionally, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Cranial nerve five is a big one in, in the face. Tell us what it does. 
Well, trigeminal nerve has two major functions. One is it does general touch sensation for all of our faces, from our foreheads to the tip of our nose and down onto our chin. So everything you touch on your face is trigeminal nerve for the most part, even your corneas on your eyeballs. The nerve also does motor to the muscles of mastication, the muscles that you use to chew food, not the ones that you use to smile or frown in. That's what Jason's doing right now. It's frowning. <laughs> I'm not frowning. I'm learning. I'm learning. So, and if you have a really, really sensitive face, like crocodiles do, and uh, we sort of do, um, we get a really, really big trigeminal nerve. It gets really fat because it's got lots of nerves piping through it. So, you know, the more wiring you need for something, the more wires you need. So our trigeminal nerve can be quite large in diameter because we have fairly sensitive faces also. Like with us, we have very sensitive lips um, and our noses, so to speak, are quite sensitive. So the nerves that are innervating the touch receptors in our lips have lots of nerves to them. So therefore the nerve itself is pretty big. So we can use that proxy, basically the diameter of the nerve or how big the bony canal is and fossil to get a good idea of how thick that nerve is. And if that nerve's thick, then that tells us that there's a lot of wires going into some sort of organ. And in this case, it might be that organ of face touch. And so you mentioned that that's not the nerve that's responsible for moving our faces, but it is in a sense of a croc, actually all animals, responsible for moving the jaw. There isn't a lot of face other than sort of a flat looking snout in a crocodilian and so many people think of the face as really just the jaw there's a lot more to it than that those muscles are not controlled by the trigeminal nerve so it's you know it's interesting it's always been fascinating to me that like we can feel our muscles moving right we can feel the skin that the muscles in our face are moving with a different nerve than the the nerve that's actually making that skin move and that's that's fascinating same thing with the tongue right if we bite the tip of our tongue and it starts to bleed we actually feel that pain through one nerve and we taste that blood through a different nerve. It's fascinating to me to think about that. So so how did you get interested in crocs, right? Crocodilians? Because I understand that this is all coming from a place of a love for dinosaurs, right? I mean, that's where a lot of people get pulled into this. How did you decide to focus on crocodilians as opposed to other fossil taxa? God, I don't know. Um, I grew up beachside Florida, and I've always had alligators around, so I think they've been a spirit animal outside of the dead raccoons that I would poke with sticks, I guess, growing up. But, uh, but yeah, I went to Florida, which is the Florida Gators, so we did gators there. We um, worked at a, a Miocene fossil site in Florida where we had fossils of alligator olsoni, and so I guess I kind of always into gators on that side of things, but... When I went to graduate school, we kind of learned that we needed to be experts in crocodile anatomy to understand dinosaur anatomy because they're one of dinosaurs' living relatives. So if we know dinosaurs, we also have to know crocodiles. So the Miocene site that you worked at, can you give us a sense of the time frame for that? Because you know people might have heard Miocene, but not, not sure how old that is, right? How old is that? So Florida doesn't have any really old fossils like dinosaurs and Cretaceous rocks. It only It's basically a giant sandbar. And so um, it has a, a nice set of sinkhole deposits from around 18 million years ago, which is some of the late Miocene. Um, one site is called Thomas Farm. Thomas Farm is an 18 million year old sinkhole deposit in which animals have been falling into this pit for thousands of years back then. Uh, the Florida Museum goes out and collects lots of bones of three-toed horses, early dogs, uh, things called bear dogs, lots of early camels, and little deer things too. I love how you refer to this you know, 18 million year old site as being not that old, right? Having done work myself in ape evolution um, in the past where 18 million years ago would be like a long time ago for ape evolution, literally a drop in the bucket for dinosaur time blows my mind. The concept of deep time, it's really hard to put my mind around it. One of the things that you mentioned actually about the reason for needing to understand crocodilian anatomy was to understand dinosaur anatomy. And it's this idea that we can sort of bracket fossil taxa by their most closely related living taxa and try to infer what that anatomy or behavior or whatever other physiologic characteristic we are interested in might have looked like in that ancestor. Can you tell us how um, you've been able to apply what you've learned about crocodilian anatomy to some of the bigger questions in dinosaur paleontology? We're in the midst of actually getting a bunch of papers written up on, on some of the bigger questions. But what we've been able to kind of do is that crocodiles and birds are to their each closest relatives today, and dinosaurs and pterosaurs are in the middle. And these two extant groups of animals, birds and crocs, have both evolved skulls that are very different from one another. Birds have very flexible heads, 
They have lots of extra joints in their skulls. They can wiggle their upper beaks around. Whereas crocodiles have largely kind of sutured all their bones in their skull together. It's very stiff, rigid things. So they have two animals that do very, very different things with their heads. But they both evolved from a very similar stock of kind of dinosaur-like animals about 250 million years ago. And so we've been kind of chasing down how you go from an animal that looked like early proto-dinosaur thing that sort of had some joints inside of it. They weren't probably movable, but they bit hard and they had fairly stiff heads. And then that kind of animal diverged into croc line animals and bird line animals. And along the way, there's a lot of evolution along the way, but out of that group of dinosaurs came these really weird little flexible headed birds. And out of that group of crocodile line animals came these really stiff skulled crocs. And what we've been able to kind of get at is the role of jaw muscles inside the heads of these animals, what it means for joints and how joints are loaded. So again, just like we walk around on our knees and our feet and our ankles and our hips, we put all sorts of forces upon those joints while we walk and it causes all sorts of, we can run and we can walk and but then we get arthritis and things break down and stuff. In the head, we have all sorts of joints in our skulls too, like the jaw joint that I'm operating quite a bit right now is under certain types of loads. And if I want to eat breakfast, I'm going to put lots of loading through that joint. Along the way to birds, along the way to crocodiles, we see major changes in how the joints change shape and how the muscles change their forces or their anatomies around those joints to basically build these stiff-skulled, hard-biting crocodile things versus the flexible-headed, not-quite-hard-biting birdie things. And those types of rules, you might say, we're going to be applying to dinosaurs better as we get better kind of 3D models built. And one of the biggest challenges we've had in the last five years is that we have to build really complicated three-dimensional models of all these animals to get some of the mechanics accurate to the best of our ability. And those types of tools and kind of these bigger approaches are going to serve to be really useful for kind of comparative biomechanics and creative fish biology of reptiles going forward. We made little discoveries along the way, like, you know, T-Rex could bite a certain number of Newtons and crocodiles have ball and socket joints, even though they don't have any wiggliness to them. Mm. Cool, these little things. Um, but the bigger picture is that we can do all the things that we're kind of doing. We can apply them to, to smaller parts of the clade going forward. So I have a question then about mechanics of chewing in crocodilians. Like if we think about a video of watching, uh, you know, a Nile crocodile tearing into a, a prey, death rolling or whatever, we think about biting, we think of just a really savage event where there's just constant chomping, chomping, chomping with a lot of force. But I know that at least within primates, but I think this extends out within mammalia as well. When we bite into something, we actually modulate how much force we use with each successive bite because we don't want to crack our teeth, right? So we use the most force when we first take our first bite. And then with each successive cycle of chewing, we actually use less force because the, the pieces that we're trying to break down are lower. Is that true in crocodilians too? Or because they don't have to protect their teeth the same way that mammals do, for example, because mammals only get two sets of teeth, do they not have to worry about that quite as much because they can just replenish their teeth? That is a great question, Dr. Organ. The role of the periodontal ligament in reptiles versus mammals is still kind of unknown. So the periodontal ligament and the periodontal nerve is what holds our teeth in, and that's the what Jason's um, talking about in terms of when you bite stuff, your teeth don't have nerves in them, but they're little nerves in the roots that sense how much force is being applied to the teeth. And so we have enough jaw muscles that we can crack down on anything and crack our teeth. But these nerves tell our brains how to modulate the force that Jason's talking about. So in animals like crocodiles, which constantly replace their teeth throughout life, do they need a periodontal ligament as much? Do they need a nerve into those teeth as much if they're just going to shed those teeth after they crack them or whatever? And that's a really great question that we don't have answers to. What we do know is that crocodiles, so crocodiles have a long history of not eating other animals. There have been a number of crocodiles that have diverged into herbivorous niches over the years. There's a whole clade of South American and African crocodiles that eat plants. And what we see in plant-eating animals is they'll tend to also um, increase the amount of enamel they have in their teeth, kind of like some of our plant-eating recent ancestors, like uh, robust hominins, perhaps. So we actually started measuring the enamel of lots of different types of crocodiles, plant-eating crocodiles and unclear fossil crocs. And all of them keep really thin enamel thickness. None of them actually build more enamel in their teeth. So going along with this idea that maybe they don't need really big periodontal nerves 
since they don't have really thick enamel either, they can probably shed their teeth without caring too much about occlusion. Again, we invest a lot of um, energy into making sure our really awesome teeth occlude with one another. Right. So occlusion just meaning they're lining up properly. Right. So crocs, we don't think that they need to occlude their teeth as much, or at least modern crocs. Again, we have fossil crocodile relatives that were eating plants. They had heterodony, meaning they had canines and incisors and molars, kind of like we do. So they had different shaped teeth along their tooth row, which suggests a higher order of food processing than modern crocodiles employ. Right. Because like, for example, we take a bite with our incisors, right? And then we move our food toward our cheek teeth, our molars, where we actually do the grinding. So this would be sort of differentiating where biting and chewing happens in the mouth. Whereas in modern crocs, um, you know, the ones we think about living down, you know, in Florida, for example, maybe not crocs, gators there, but, uh, or the Nile crocodile, we think about these like cone shaped teeth that are just tear into stuff, right? Yeah. So, um, modern crocs today, their, their canines and incisors are more pointy. They do have these more bulbous or mushroom shaped molar teeth in the back. And, and gators in particular, when they grab turtles, which are very hard animals to eat, they'll actually grab the turtles with their sharp front teeth, but then work the turtles back towards their molars, which they also have the highest amount of bite force to put into their um, food items, just like we do. Like we move carrots to the back of our mouth where they're easier to crush. Um, and so uh, crocs will actually, it's kind of, let's say, functional heterodony, meaning they'll move a prey item back to where they have higher kind of bite performance mm-hmm. to then crunch the turtles. And those teeth are, aren't as pointy. They're actually broader, flatter, and more kind of squat-shaped teeth. Right. Modern gators have like purely, let's say, homodont or the same types of teeth. And so that differentiated shape makes them more efficient at crushing things than piercing things, for example. Yeah, for the most part. I want to shift gears, actually, and talk about one of the things that I think is probably just as important as the work, the actual basic science work that you're doing, but certainly more important for the general public, and that is the outreach that you do. You've been sort of directing this program called Dinosaurs and Cavemen Science Expo for a number of years now, which meets at a local um, high school in Columbia, Missouri, and brings um, scientists from the entire mid-Missouri region, but also internationally you bring in speakers, or at least speakers with an international reach, recognizing that budgets aren't what they are. We're not always bringing people over from overseas, but tell us a little bit about sort of how you got involved in running this program, what was the sort of um, inspiration for it, and then what is the end goal? I've always liked sharing science with the public. It seems to be in my nature. And so even as an undergrad and working as a technician at Disney World, I would leave our lab from prepping fossils and go talk to the public about what was happening behind the glass. And at one point, my boss at the time got a little grumpy that I was spending too much time yapping and not enough time um, air scribing. But that's okay. Paleontologists, we have the one of the most accessible types of sciences out there to, to reach the public. Kind of paleontology and some aspects of probably health sciences are the two most uh, accessible forms of science and technology for a lot of people. And so we like to share anatomy. Uh, we like to share fossils in the natural history of Missouri, but also the planet. Cool community. And so I've always enjoyed talking dinosaurs with folks. And that means usually some aspect of their anatomy and what we've learned about them recently. Um, We're not all just like Fred Flintstone era paleontology, but we've actually learned a lot of things um, since the 50s. So um, when I started getting faculty jobs, like the one I have here, we are in the middle of Missouri, which is technically in the almost center of the contiguous United States. We're the middle of nowhere and equidistant to everywhere. And we don't have any museums anywhere nearby. There's a science center in St. Louis, and there's some stuff in Kansas City, but nothing's necessarily uh, organized. So I took it upon ourselves. I talked to my friends and colleagues here, and we had a pretty big bustling group of undergrads and graduate students. And we basically started doing a a pop-up natural history museum. And so we called the Dinosaurs and Cavemen Science Expo because we have biological anthropologists that work with us. And so that's the caveman part. We by no means suggest that dinosaurs and cavemen live together like the Flintstones, although we still have living dinosaurs all around us in the form of birds. But anyway, so we uh, basically have about 25 different tables at this expo every year. So I get a bunch of members of the community together. I get a bunch of departments from campus together, and we probably have about 25 tables and maybe 60 or so volunteers that all meet 
close to about 1,200 people a day when we do these expos. The demos include touch tables where we have real fossils from geology. We have skulls and stuff that people play with. But we also have a ton of activities um, that not only kind of take that alpha level type of like awareness or this is a fossil, oh, cool. But then we have people do exercises and activities to learn second and third order things about it. So we had one called um, uh, Dinosaur Tracks where we we made these little sponge theropod feet, like three finger, three toed feet. Yeah, yeah. Strap these little sponge sandals on the kid's feet and then they get them wet and then they walk across butcher paper. And so they leave little wet theropod tracks. But you can go and measure the distances between those and then estimate mm-hmm. Um, stride length and then also speed from some basic math. So that was a way we could basically just pretend that they're paleontologists, but they go find a, a fossil trackway somewhere out west, for example, and they can basically try to figure out what kind of dinosaur it is based off of the footprint shape, but then also measure some aspects about the size of that animal and the speed it was traveling at. And so we have a bunch of activities like that too. Like we have another one, which is a box that's got a, a, a hand, a shovel handle threaded in it with a bunch of bungee cords attached to it. And that models muscles. So all the bungee cords are muscle fibers. And we can arrange them in like a pennate or fan shape orientation, or we can make them all parallel fiber. And it takes more force to pull on the one that's got multi-pennate bungee cords attaching to it than like a parallel fiber one. And that those muscle boxes kind of mimic like a pectoralis muscle versus a biceps in terms of the amount of force and excursion one can get out of different types of muscles that we have in our body. Kind of a mix of awareness tables. So we'll have like the local fossil club and local herb club and the raptor rehabilitation place will bring some live dinosaurs there because, you know, a hawk is a living dinosaur. So we'll have this, this sign that says living dinosaurs. And this older woman came up to me one year and said, I didn't see no living dinosaurs. Where's their T-Rex? like well we have a hawk right in an owl right over here you can walk across along these tables where we have all these dinosaur skulls you kind of learn about the evolution and progression of theropod dinosaurs you know like allosaurus and t-rex to oviraptors to velociraptors to archaeopteryx which are our first like you know flying dinosaurs and birds and stuff and at the end of that table we'll actually have conservation biologists with a bunch of stuffed dinosaurs like ducks and then we'll have our live dinosaurs after that which is the raptor rehab group so anyways, we've been doing dinosaurs in Cayman for about 10 years now, since uh, we got a little waylaid by coronavirus. Um, right. right. Killer activity we do here in town, a little waylaid by coronavirus. Um, right. right. Killer activity we do here in town. Um, we're branching out and developing a lot of these activities towards actually uh, what looks to be like sixth to eighth grade school classes now. Um mm-hmm with our local Columbia public school group after this week to start developing more um, directed activities um, that, that insert us right into the schools around town to kind of take a lot of these expo activities onto, uh, there's a traveling bus called the Steam Bus, which is probably similar to whatever the bus is the Grateful Dead drove around in. <laughs> Speak, you're speaking my love language now. I know, I figured. And then we're going to have some kind of specialized kind of classes come out of this down the road. But all this is to try to increase science literacy. Mm-hmm. Paleontology lets us talk about extinction and climate change. But the, the hard science we kind of do with it is actually math and physics. So we get to talk about lever mechanics and um, material properties of things and how animals are built and how they work. Because we basically work on engineering and physics of animals. Um, so not only can we like show them bones and, and feathers or whatever, but then talk about how, you know, feathers that are all black have a lot more melanin in them, which makes them stiffer. Harder to like ground, grind down the toenails of a dog with black toenails and it is to grind down the nails of a dog with blonde toenails, so to speak, because that extra melanin actually makes them stiffer. Interesting. So I always wondered if uh, if the choice to name it Dinosaurs and Cavemen was actually a way of grabbing the bull by the horns and saying, listen, you're coming here, you're going to learn about Dinosaurs and Cavemen, and we're going to tell you right now, they never lived together. We're trying to take back that phrase a little bit, I guess, because being in Missouri, where a lot of folks live some distance away from educational opportunities, Mm -hmm. and it's part of our job to try to get out there better. I also want to point out, which is something you didn't actually mention, that this Dinosaurs and Cavemen got its start as part of a National Science Foundation grant to study the basic science, right? Or at least it has used money from the NSF to help build yeah. it. 
And I think that's an important thing for our listeners to understand is that, you know, when we do research that's funded by the federal government, there always has to be a public part of it, especially when it's National Science Foundation grants. Now, we've talked on the podcast a lot about how the NSF funds a very different set of science than the National Institutes of Health does. And the public outcomes for National Institutes of Health research are really curing diseases or finding new treatments to cure diseases. At least that's ultimately what they're supposed to be about. National Science Foundation is not supposed to be directly dealing with health. And so there has to be some kind of other public output that's important. And this is a really good example of how you can take basic science directed at understanding large scale evolutionary questions, but make them accessible And not only accessible, but integrated into the community in a way that allows the public to be part of that discovery in some sense, right? Because you can bring your latest, newest finds directly to the public and share with them in language that they can understand much better than trying to go back and read the papers that even some of your colleagues might not understand all the time. The best thing about some of these activities is that we're also training our current graduate students and undergrads how to talk about what they're learning about in our labs and learning how to talk about this wonky stuff to the general public or their families. And again, we have a lot of students in our lab that go home and their parents are like, what do you do? (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. kind of like dinosaur skulls. And and so they get good at explaining the relevance and and kind of how we're using a mixture of biology and geology and stuff together to figure out kind of how life has worked on the planet. And so it's good for our students to kind of learn how to do this stuff too. And apparently it's good for you because you've developed apparently enough of the empathy that you didn't have to get into vet school (laughs) in order to now teach uh, the next generation of scientists and also the next generation of members Uh, of the general public, which is fantastic. I can never be a veterinarian. (laughs) Horrible days. Once again, our guest today is Dr. Casey Holliday, uh, Associate Professor of Anatomy from the University of Missouri School of Medicine. Casey is a dinosaur paleontologist, a crocodilian anatomist, and an overall wonderful guy. Casey, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Where can our listeners find you on social media? Uh, on social media, I'm Croc Holiday on Twitter <laughs> with two L's. And then you can find me on, on Google really easily. Excellent. We will make sure that there are links to your lab site and uh, all the really cool three-dimensional imaging that you've produced for all of these cool models you've built of crocodilian skulls. And so, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, It's really great to talk to you. Thank you so much to Dr. Casey Holliday for talking to us. I love dinosaurs. I love crocodiles. I love talking about things biting each other. And uh, we got a lot of that in that episode. Well, that is going to do it for another one. My name is James. If you want to follow me, go over to Twitter at James underscore read three. Steffi, where can everybody find you? You can find me on Twitter at Steffi Deem. And Jason, where can everyone find what's going on in your life? Also on Twitter at Oregon JM. If you want to follow this podcast, go to Twitter at Science Night and the number one. If you want to find out what we're doing, look at our back catalog and see if anything else is going on with the Science Night brand, go to SciNight.com. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever you find it. It is the one thing that we can do effectively to break through the podcast noise, and there is a lot of it. That is going to do it for another episode of the Science Night Podcast. We will be back in two weeks, and until then, have a great night. The Science Night Podcast is a proud member of the River Power Podcast Mill. To find out more about our shows, go to riverpower.xyz. Your internet's amazing. Go get a dongle. <laughs> that, that should be the new uh, theme song for the episode, right? Yeah, right. James, can you take that clip and then like change the pitch and <laughs> harmonize it? with Steffi's own voice, a couple of different, like, four-part harmony. Awooga!
Tango.